This is my grandma. She's one of the wisest women I know, but it usually takes me some time to fully understand her words of wisdom. Growing up, my brother and I were never allowed to blow out the candles on our birthday cakes. We were taught that light is a symbol of life and to blow it out was taboo. It wasn't until years later, until this year in fact, when COVID hit, that I realized the meaning behind her words. It turns out that when we blow out candles on birthday cakes, we're essentially spraying our spit and germs all over this cake, which we're then feeding to friends and family. That's pretty gross. Well, scientists at Clemson University came to the same conclusion a couple of years ago when they published a peer-reviewed article that quantified the amount of bacteria that accumulates due to candle blowing. How is it that my grandma, who was equipped solely with her cultural traditions and her sixth grade education, was able to arrive at the same conclusion decades before these renowned scientists? It's because science and tradition are really just two different sides of the same coin. Tradition tells us what to do, and science explains why we should do it. For example, the traditions laid out in the Bhagavad Gita tell us about the practice of meditation. When the great warrior Arjuna was on the Kurukshetra battlefield, he was frozen into an action due to his feelings of guilt and attachment. His friend and acting charioteer, Lord Krishna, helps to guide him back to a sense of purpose using techniques such as role transition and mindfulness. These techniques have since become deeply embedded in the Hindu tradition. Science then goes on to explain why we should meditate. It turns out that modern cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, uses these techniques of role transition and mindfulness to reduce amygdala activation and cortisol levels, which means we're reducing our fear and stress response. Science and tradition both work to answer the same essential questions of human nature. They just do so from different perspectives. Unfortunately, science and tradition have a long history of disagreement. From the heliogeocentric debate between Galileo and the Catholic Church, to the debate between Ayurvedic homeopathy and modern allopathic medicine, we've seen far too many examples of what happens when science and tradition butt heads. No wonder we've come to regard the two as worlds apart, even mutually exclusive. Why did this storm between science and tradition arise in the first place? To understand that, we need to first learn that tradition was created with a certain intent, a certain purpose in mind. Be it the morning ritual of drinking turmeric and honey ginger tea, or the taboo against blowing out candles on birthday cakes, Tradition has withstood the test of time to carry the accumulated knowledge of our ancestors across generations. But over time, we grew blind to the original intent, the original purpose behind these traditions, and we've corrupted them in the process. Take menstrual practices in India as an example. To perform chores back in the day, women had to walk long distances to fetch water to boil rice and vegetables. They had to wash clothes by hand by beating them on a rock. They had to carry heavy loads on their back and their hip. Today's scientific research shows us what our ancestors already knew, that heavy lifting during menses puts immense strain on the womb. To prevent potential harm to the woman, our ancestors ensured that the husband would take over the household chores during those few days. But over time, we grew blind to the intent behind those traditions. And now we tell women that they cannot step foot into the kitchen, that they cannot touch the laundry, that they cannot perform puja to God. What began as a way to give relief to women from these responsibilities during these few days turned into a taboo that saw women and their periods as filthy and impure. See, tradition is like a mango on a tree. In the beginning, the mango is raw and bitter and no one really likes it. When that same mango ripens, it becomes sweet to the taste and everyone loves it. But once its window of time passes, 
the mango can become rotten if it's not picked off the tree and preserved properly. Think about how you make mango preserves. You take the mango, you mash it up, you slice it up. It no longer looks like the mango that you began with, but the original mango taste is the same. The same principle applies to preserving our traditions. When we take the traditions of our past to fit the needs of our present, they may not look the same any longer, but we have to ensure that the original taste, the original intent is preserved. Now, tradition isn't the only one that's undergone corruption like this. Science has gone through the same corruption. See, science at its core is a humble curiosity of our world and of ourselves. But over time, we've lost that humility. We sit atop our ivory towers of science, looking down at anyone who can't possibly understand us. We think them to be stupid or ignorant or just outright evil. Take the example of controlling forest fires, an all too familiar problem here in California. For thousands of years, the indigenous tribes of California, including the Yurok and Hoopa, have practiced the tradition of controlled burning. So by burning old brush, they not only prevented larger and more dangerous wildfires from occurring, but they also regenerated food resources and habitats for animals. Unfortunately, scientists and ecologists of the National Forest Service thought these traditions to be primitive and destructive. And so they moved to outlaw these groups from migrating and from practicing their tradition of controlled burning. It wasn't until a hundred years later that these laws were finally discovered to be harmful and dangerous to the environment. But so much of the forest has been lost in that time. For so long, the scientific community has arrogantly brushed aside traditions that have offered hope to people for so many years. And in the same vein, cultural leaders have vehemently opposed scientific advancement out of fear that the rapid progress of science would mean the ruin of their age-old traditions. These mutual misunderstandings have fueled this divide between science and tradition, and we've since been forced to choose sides. There is a way out of this storm, however. If we can restore the original ideals and core values of both science and tradition, we can bridge them back together in our search for truth and understanding. Firstly, we must ensure that we harness the traditional knowledge of our past such that it is applicable to our world today. For example, Yale professor Yoon Chi Chang and his team recently discovered a new drug that promises to treat cancer with minimal side effects. Pretty cool, huh? But guess what? His drug was inspired by the traditional herbal medicines described in ancient Chinese texts from thousands of years ago. By using tradition to inspire his search, Professor Chang has literally pioneered a new path in the field of pharmacology and cancer research. That being said, we must also remember the original intent and purpose behind our traditions. We can do so using the scientific method, which teaches us to question the limitations of our existing body of knowledge and dares us to ask why. See, the storm between science and tradition is one that cannot go unresolved. If we want to make innovation accessible to everyone, we have to reframe our scientific knowledge into frameworks of tradition that people are familiar with. To do so, traditional knowledge must go hand in hand with modern science. We must both learn from the knowledge of our past and learn to question the limitations of that knowledge. Only then, can we make progress available to all? So instead of being forced to choose one or the other, let's learn to value both. Let's revisit our traditions with the eye of a scientist, and let's restore the humility of science with inspiration from our grandma's traditions. Thank you.